Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, I am Dr. Melissa Harris. I am the director for the Lillian Lodge Copenhaver Center um, at Marymount University um, in Arlington, Virginia. We are a proud member uh, satellite campus of our um, of the Lillian Lodge Copenhaver Center for the Advancement of Women um, in Communication um, based out of FIU. Dr. Copenhaver is with us today. We're so glad to have her and all of our satellite campuses that have joined us. Um, and before we get started, I would like, because I have my dean here, um, Dean Marnell Miles Goins is here. I'd like us her to just give a brief welcome to everyone. Um, she's also a woman in communication. She will actually be the first African-American woman who will be the president of the National Communication Association. Um, and she's doing an amazing job planning this year's convention here at National Harbor. So taking time out of her schedule today to be with us, it's an honor for her to be with us today. So um, Marnell, would you uh, just welcome and greet everyone? Uh, Dr. Harris, you took half of my, my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, I, I want to say hello and uh, and welcome to everyone. Um, my undergrad and graduate degrees are all in communication. So the yeah, Lillian Lodge Copenhaver Center for Women in Communication is near and dear to my heart. I am also a past president of the Organization for Research on Women in Communication and um, a past president of the Western States Communication Association. And I'm planning uh, the upcoming National Communication Associations Convention in November. And so I'm, I'm super excited about um, this center, as well as this panel in particular. Um, and you'll hear Dr. Anderson talk. She and I, I think, graduated from Howard the exact same year. Uh, and so I won't tell you how she behaved at Howard, but you can talk to me offline. And I do want to say hi to, um, to Dr. Corrigan. Uh, as well as Dr. Watkins Dickerson. Hopefully I'll see all of you in November. And I really look forward to listening in on this panel and hearing your insights. For those of you who are students or faculty from other universities, welcome to um, this program. And um, Dr. Harris has also tasked me with monitoring the chat. So if you have questions for the panelists, for Dr. Harris or about the uh, center in general, please put it in the chat and I will um, try to send those messages to the specific panelists. So thank you for having me and thank you to the panelists. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Niles Gollins. Really appreciate that. So without any further ado, uh, we will go on ahead and begin. Today we have an amazing panel of outstanding women scholars. Uh, Dr. Lisa Corrigan is a writer and activist and pro uh, professor. She's the co-host of Lean Back Critical Feminist Conversations podcast. We also have Dr. Camille Anderson, who is a scholar and activist founder and executive director of Bilingual Brown Babies. And then we also have Dr. Diana Watkins Dickerson, who is a rhetorician, a scholar, a preacher. Uh, she is a chaplain in the United States Army, I believe. Um, and she's the host of Teach preach broadcast. And so today, um, ladies, we will be engaging the topic of communication, branding, and self-promotion. Uh, so to kind of get it started, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and sharing what it is, the type of communication research that you engage in. Um, we'll start with you, Dr. Corrigan. Thanks for the invitation to be here, Dr. Harris. It's lovely to be with you all. Congratulations to Dr. Niles Goins on your accomplishments. I'm excited to see you at National Harbor. Um, so I'm a professor of communication. I work in rhetoric. I mostly do social movement work around civil rights and black power. I also do some work on feminist theory and queer theory. I direct the gender studies program at the U of A. Um, I suppose I'm, I was invited to talk about my podcast. I'll do a little bit of that, but I sort of have two different lives. I sort of joke that I moonlight as a professor because I'll, I do that job and I do a lot of it. But I also have a second life as like a political strategist. And so a lot of the things I'm going to say today are about sort of crossing the streams between the academy and politics. So even though I write books and I write articles, I'm a contributor to The Nation magazine. I have a very popular podcast. I also do political trainings. I write statute. I build legislation. I coalition build. And I teach people how to lobby. And so for me, in this question about branding, I really want to talk about what it means when you live your values rather than when you become a commodity for people to consume. And I imagine that we'll come back to that, but I'm happy to pass the mic. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, and moving on, Dr. Anderson. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Kami Anderson. I am a public scholar, and um, a lot of my scholarship is around the activism and around anti-racist language hegemony in the world language classroom, in particular looking at how Black children negotiate and foment identities in multiple languages and who is around to support that for them. Um, for me, I guess my role for today will be around um, talking about just the ways in which I use technology and social media and things of that nature in order to continue to push this particular public communication agenda. And I'm looking forward to doing that. It is great to see familiar faces in Dr. Niles Goins and in Dr. Watkins Dickinson. And I am looking forward to seeing some of you all in November. Thank you. Dr. Watkins Dickerson. Good afternoon, everyone. First and foremost, thank you, Dr. Harris, Dr. Niles Goings, and of course, already uh, Dr. Corrigan and Anderson. It's so good to see you all here. And so, just with that, right, um, I think a little bit about me. I am Dr. Diana Nicole Watkins Dickerson, the full name. And so with that, I like to say I'm a scholar, preacher, and a veteran. That's my tagline everywhere you will see that everywhere I go, that's what you will see. And I think it's particularly important in talking about the church space because we love protocol. So I want to make sure that not just protocol is established, but I really do believe that you should get your flowers while you're yet living. And so all four of you ladies mean so much to me, and it's a pleasure to be here. But quickly, uh, I'm a scholar. I am a womanist scholar, and I study rhetoric at the intersections of race, religion, gender, and politics particularly. Uh, so I like to talk about the two things people don't like to talk about at the dinner table, and that's politics and religion. And so anywhere that shows up, I love to discuss it. Um, I'm also an ordained itinerant elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and I pastor not in a civilian space, but in a military space. And so, no, I am not in the Army. I am in the Air Force. Air Force and sorry. so, yes, very close, <laughs> very close. Um, we were born out of the Army, um, but it's just so good to be here. And I can't wait to dive into the conversation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Watkins. Uh, you kind of set us up on the next question kind of perfectly. So we'll kind of bridge what Dr. Corrigan was talking about. So you were saying tagline. So everywhere you go, it's recognizable. So you put your stamp on it. Um, and so we know it's you because you identified those intersections where you cross. And so wherever someone sees your name, they'll remember and that's making it memorable. So my, my next question is, can you share the ways in which technology, you use technology to kind of further your agenda and your call and your branding? Um, so whether it's your taglines and people recognize you. So when we see Lisa Corrigan, we know that this must be something about X, Y, and Z. So how do you use and engage technology um, in establishing that? Um, I, I'm assuming, and maybe this is bad that you wanted me to start first and then Dr. Corrigan. No, I better not because I know you. you'll take me somewhere else. So hold on. Let me let Dr. Corrigan go first oh, yeah. and then I'll come back to you. <laughs> That's hilarious. I, I, you know, I'm grieving Twitter's slow death. I guess I should start by saying um, it's terrible when monsters take over things that should be public utilities. So, um, I, you know, I love Twitter because I'm pithy and I do humor, which is like really not where my people generally live in the space in the public world. And so I think I probably built my reputation such as it is, at least in my perception of it, through humor on the internet first, humor mostly about politics. But I think it really grew, it grew out of two things. One, I made a joke about the insurrection that went massively viral and I got like 10,000 followers in a day. It was completely wild and a bunch of hate mail. But, um, and, it, and it was a really, it was just like, I just, it was a throwaway joke, right? I was, you know, a bunch of women were, joking about catfishing, you know, folks in the inter in, at the insurrection on January 6th, because they were like, oh, they're all putting all of their Nazi bona fides on the internet. And I was like, get in girls, let's go hunting. And it went super viral and it was hilarious. And, and I recount it not just because we're in obviously a 
crisis moment for American democracy, but also because my DMs were full of stories of all kinds of people who wanted to talk through their feelings about the 2016 election, about the Trump presidency, about watching the insurrection unfold on TV live, about the threat to, you know, electoral politics. And it ended up being this very weird convergence of intimacy with a bunch of publics that I really didn't know that I had already collected. And so I'm happy to talk about that at length, but I would say that's that was an inflection point for me. The second part is threads. And so the idea that you can curate longer form ideas in short, pithy spaces is very appealing to me because I think it gets out of the academic bubble and it allows us to connect across generations with lots of different kind of people who just happen to be online at the same time and who then look for my content. So I would say I think that they're, you know, just... I'll pass the mic, but I, I just think that there are two ways to do it. You have moments that explode and then you have deeply curated intellectual content that people want more of. And I would say that the people are hungry for more intellectual content and kudos to you all um, and uh, to Lillian Copenhagen for creating these kinds of spaces to tie us all together. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. For me with technology, I use it a number of ways. One, um, it's the just the basic logistics of being able to meet with my families and my babies and all of that stuff. I'm using just the ever clunky, even though we're on it, Zoom and all of those things. But in terms of how the brand actually started, it really started on IG for me, where I would do IG videos of me and my kids just speaking Spanish at home and kind of removing the novelty of Black people can speak other languages. <laughs> and that kind of grew into me using IG now for um, being, I'm pretty much known for within language bases as the Black woman that does language. <laughs> if you want Black in language, that's who you need to go to. And I'll get like, I, like Lisa, I'll get DMs like, hey, did you see this? And it's some random TikTok of some Black person speaking Spanish. Like, you know, like, do you know her? No, I don't. <laughs> but but um, then it kind of morphed into me using IG more so as an educational space. So being able to talk about those aspects of Black history when it comes to language. And it started with Spanish. And then when I began to introduce the, the French language, I started doing more French things too. And spending time actually giving the, I spent 30 days in the area around February, because I like to extend beyond that, just giving facts about Blacks and language for 30 days straight. And that content generates interest, which generates me, people then going to my products and my services in order to make sure that I'm able to do stuff. But um, it's been really helpful in terms of being able to have that face. IG was like, I do, I have threads, I have Twitter or X, what, what are we calling it now? I don't know. Um, the Newton, yeah. <laughs> but I have those things, but having other Black families and other Black children see a body that looks like them in real time on IG has been the most helpful. Them being able to see teachers, being able to see, oh, this is how this can happen. Oh, you are, you are a Spanish teacher just like me at some point in your life. And you had these same struggles. So being able to have that 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 facial recognition was really helpful for me when it came to using IG. And that's why I kind of focus there when it comes to how I do stuff. But then I also have my own community app where when people work with me, I push them there so that they can have a safe space to be able to negotiate language learning in a way that supports not just their language learning ability, but also their um, their racial identity. And we focus on those things in that space as well. Awesome, thank you. And then Dr. Watkins Dickerson, uh, same question. Well, you know, I think my journey with technology has been quite funny. Um, and it's funny that um, Dr. Corrigan, like we don't know about Twitter X, whatever's happening there. Um, and then Dr. Anderson, Instagram, well, I typically will use Facebook as a space. Um, so we're kind of, you know, covering all of these three spaces, which converge at, at some points, obviously. Um, but I actually started really getting interested with social media in particular, uh, right when YouTube came out. And I always said, man, I want to do YouTube. I want to do YouTube. But as much as I will go public and I'll, you know, uh, preach and teach and whatever, I, I guess the Lord has me doing uh, in those times, 
I am still a very private person. And so YouTube, it was just too much. You, you're in my house, you're in my bathroom. That's too much, right? Um, but uh, during the pandemic, so fast forward some years, during the pandemic, um, I started Walk With Me. And really it was just a motivational walk around literally my cove. And I would walk my cove, I would walk down the street, then sometimes my neighbors would stick their head in and stuff, you know, and then uh, I think it started raining one time, my husband came and he's walking with me with an umbrella. And it started really just out of an impetus to motivate um, during the pandemic when people were so far apart, but so close together. And we use social media as a space to kind of connect. And also, that really just created space for Teach and Preach. So Teach and Preach was truly born out of the walks. And um, really, I got pregnant. And I was like, I can't be walking in this cold. Like, it's too hot in Memphis, right? And so that's really what started happening. But one thing I would say in regard to technology that I've seen and Drs. Corgan and Anderson have really highlighted that is ride the wave. You have to, yes, understand the algorithm. And I've done consulting for folks in all sorts of different spaces, and I still do consulting, um, but ride the wave of the algorithm. Right now, what's really happening on Instagram and Facebook, for example, is uh, reels, are the reels, right? Uh, TikTok, that's another space. And a lot of that was born out of Snapchat, and right? And so riding that wave, really can help position you. And then once you understand how hashtags work. So like, for example, right now, you might want to write this down. The days are gone of putting 30 different hashtags because I think that used to be the limit. Now you want to be a little bit more pointed with your hashtags, you know, not thank you, Jesus, or, you know, uh, blue, blue ribbons. I, I don't know. You're just putting all sorts of stuff. But now you have to be very, very thought thoughtful about your hashtags. So where we used to do 20 or 30, now you only really want three to five tops maybe. So that's a trend that I'm seeing. And so I would say I use technology once again, um, definitely within my calling. And I feel where um, I'm supposed to be. And which is why I've taken a break from teach and preach because now I'm actually on military duty. So I don't have the space for some of the things that I used to do. But beyond that, I would say ride the wave, understand the algorithm, but more importantly, figure out how the algorithm works for you. So we do have a question in the chat kind of along that those lines. I appreciate that. I'm going to come back because I had a question, but I want to make sure that I get every student's question um, as they come in because I this is for them, so it's not just about what I want to ask. So the question is, what are some of the ways you recommend university students can ride the wave? How can they ride the wave? Um, so we'll start with uh, Dr. Anderson. Go ahead. Take that SEO class. <laughs> I know it's like people try to they steer away from it. Like, oh, I don't want to do that. The the the, the metrics. I don't I don't want to. That is it's really important to be able to do that. That way you can be able to understand what is happening. Like the in order to understand the algorithm, you have to really know how to study the algorithm. Like Dr. Walker Dickerson was saying, you got to really know what are people really looking at. You have to really know. Well, why is it that person that I used to follow doesn't pop up as in my feed anymore. Um, and you have to understand the back end of that in order to really be successful. So don't run from the SEL classes, take them. <laughs> um, can you, can you just explain what that SEL is? Can you so that? it's the, the optimization, it's the optimization acronym for being able to see like what is, what is, what, what drives up to the top. When we do that Google search and that, that first thing pops up, what is it the thing? What is it that they did in order to make sure that they're the first one seen? And gotcha. um, I know I sat and kind of studied it through Google University in order to be able to get it. But um, with my website, if you put blacks language or blacks and bilingual, my website is the first thing pops up because of what I was able to do in terms of studying those um, that optimization to make sure that um, I'm, that I'm seen <laughs> by lots of people and making sure that you're using the right things, like making sure that you know, our keywords are important when we're writing our abstract. It's also important when we're getting our websites together, when we're, when we're um, doing our hashtags, all of that stuff is important. So all of these things that we learn with APA also apply to SEO. So let's just try to marry them together so that we can be able to really study what's happening Happening on the back end so that we can make sure that we push ourselves forward. 
Dr. Corrigan or Dr. Watkins Dickerson, anything to add to that? I think you kind of wrapped that up pretty good, Dr. Anderson. I like that. I would just say the internet's about scaffolding power. One reason I said yes to this, and in, in addition to the fact that I love Dr. Harris and these two, two esteemed colleagues on the panel were such a draw, is that uh, you scaffold power by working with other people instead of against them. And the internet works best if you're lifting and climbing together, right? That's not my idea. That's that's your Black womanist ideas, right? So like you have to be able to bring other people up with you and help them build their voice. I'm in the middle of this thing as West Virginia University is getting dismantled. I don't know the activists personally on the ground there, but I've amplified every single thing. Every single one of them has written about it because it behooves the activists on the ground to have more people and more voices and more perspectives saying similar but not the same kinds of things know who your allies are and build with them the internet works best and you can you can you know you can hack the algorithm best if you're working in tandem with other people awesome okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna move on a little bit because you've all talked a little bit about the work that you do you you are academicians. However, the work that you do really impacts the public and you have a foot into that. So you're not just preaching to the ivory tower and recycling information among scholars. And oftentimes we do that within academia. We go to conferences and we present to each other. We build ourselves up and we fight each other and go yay. Um, but we're really not doing anything to impact those communities that we are working within, right? And so I'm um, talking from a womanist perspective perspective and a woman point of views for women. Can you explain the importance of women actually being the ones to promote, to produce, and present their own information, whether it's through your websites, through your broadcasts, um, that that I, I'm just kind of interested in knowing how important the value that is for you as a woman to do what you do uh, for promoting yourself and your brand. Um, so I'll begin this one. Let me begin with Dr. Uh, Corrigan with this one? I mean, my podcast started because I needed an outlet to say things I could not say at work, right? Like I was an untenured professor in a department of almost exclusively men who were much, much older than me and had zero interest in what they thought was like some sort of hobby, I guess, about social movement activism. So I started the podcast because I, I needed a creative outlet and a space to really you know, think out loud about ideas that were really not, were gauche at my Southern predominantly white institution about net social networking organizations and civil rights. So for me, it was, it was a necessity. And I think the best, um, the best way that we become public scholars is thinking through how necessity, like our, our, the importance of our community building is leading where we go. And I, maybe the panelists have different ideas about that though. Uh, Dr. Watkins Dickerson. Um, I I agree. I agree. Um, one of the best things that you can do is say, you know, go through your phone. Who do you have in your contacts? Uh, on your contacts, who's in your network? Just in your phone, right? And that's what I started doing. I know at least, and I'm sure uh, the others would agree. Um you know, and Dr. Corrigan will be on the show soon. So, right, once we reboot, right? And it's not just about, you know, women in general or men, you know, I like to bring all sorts of perspectives for me, at least. Um, I think that that really adds fuel to the fire, but I would say not only that, so yes. Um, and, but before I forget, most universities have LinkedIn learning, okay? A lot of universities have LinkedIn <laughs> learning. So we didn't, all of these are social media platforms. This is the professional social media, right? It functions in, in large part like the others. But LinkedIn Learning gives you the opportunity to get different certifications for free. Wink, wink, foot stomp, right? So I would just kind of say that, and I know there's an SEO class that I did on LinkedIn Learning and it was free. Um, but beyond that, I would say for me, cite Black women, cite Black women. My goal and Dr. Niles Gowens, Dr. Harris, Dr. Corrigan, Dr. Anderson, y'all already know. I am trying my best to have, you know, those essays, those books, whatever, whatever. I want to make sure that I cite at least 
90% Black women. And if I can get away with that, I want to cite 100%, right? But beyond that, um, I'm like, okay, well, I can't find somebody for this, but okay, I'll go with a feminist scholar. Okay, I'll go, right? Um, and so my my goal is to, most importantly, not just cite Black women, but in particular, those who are thrust into the margins, right? Because there's this, this concept that women or, you know, marginalized people in general, and y'all see my quoting fingers here, right, are incapable of producing theory, are incapable of producing or reworking or thinking through complex narrative. That, that's not the case. Now, for me, frankly, it's just boring to continue to cite Aristotle. I think we didn't beat him half to death. I don't care. I'm not reading it. If I do read it, and I told my committee this, Okay. I said, listen, I'm grown. I have a mortgage. I have a child. I got a whole military career. So I, I don't have time for the back and forth. Right. But in that, you know, I will not, I'm not doing this. Now, if I do it, I'm going to just trash the whole thing. Right. That is one of my goals. I mean, seriously, because what we really find is that we bend and did this to think through Geneva Smitherman, right? We bend and did this. Right. And I say it in a very particular way. Right. Now, if my uh, language person, you already know the present, present, past, past, perfect, whatever. Right. My point is that we really and truly have to cite those folks who are not going to be at the center. Those folks, Dr. Corrigan, that don't look like us and put them on those platforms. And like you said, lifting as we climb. Right. I think that's Mary Church Terrell. So in that we are able, even with Dr. Harris, Dr. Niles Goins, having us together, you know, just supporting each other as we go. But I say, cite Black women. And so that's that. And the second I'll say, just like Simone Giles, the GOAT, because I can. Thank you. You all will notice, I love this uh, academic rebellion that we all have kind of going on here. That's somewhat of a theme uh, that you'll notice here. So what works, we make it work for us, our scholarship. Dr. Anderson, I'm going to let you go ahead and tap in on that before we move on. So to add to what my my lovely sister colleague has said, um, if we really sit back and think back in history, has there ever been a point where a woman wasn't pushing something? I guess, has there been a movement that has not been pushed by women in some way, shape or form, but we didn't get the chance to tell the story. And one of the things that I think is really important for us as um, women and as scholars is to make sure that we share our story because our story is not the only one. And it helps other folks to know that it's okay to talk. It's okay to be bold. It's okay to use voice. Um, I, I started my business in order to give my children other voices that look like them. My eight, my son, well, he's 14 now. Oh my God, he's 14 now. Um, my, um, <laughs> my 14 year old, when he was eight, was like, I'm not doing this Spanish thing. Don't nobody look like me do this. I'm, mm, I'm done. So I had to create a tribe for him. But that tribe was finding other people that can tell his story in order for him to be able to see that his story was worth being heard. And I think that it's really important for us to make sure that we are promoting each other, working with each other, big upping each other on a regular basis in order to make sure that we remind folks that women have always been a part of this. Y'all just didn't let us speak. And now we're like, we're demanding our voice to be present in these moments. And we're going to use our voice in this moment so that you know that what you know as a civil rights movement was actually fueled by women. What you know as a Black arts movement was actually fueled by women. What you know about a lot of these movements that have happened worldwide go back as far as you want to. There was equity in Egypt. So, and, and being able to understand that because of that, we need to be able to share and remind folks that our voice is necessary in order to complete whatever story you're trying to write. You cannot write a story without the women. So because you can't write a story without the women, then you must let us speak and you must allow us to be able to share our narratives to be included to make that picture that much, that much brighter, that much more HD if you will, so that it. people can really understand what they're doing and saying. I love that. I've got another question in the chat. Where, Dr. Harris, um, can yeah. I say this real quick? It's real quick. Yeah. Dr. Anderson started. So I will say this is also my Spelman sister. So there's that. But you started it, Dr. Anderson. And I just wrote down 
when you said women have always been pushing behind the story. And so the preacher in me just can't help but say, and who pushed Jesus, right? So I, I, I'm just going to, I'm I'm just, right? I, I, I'm just going to let that, I'm, that was right. pretty, Thank you. Right? We'll, but but, we'll but take really it. and truly, they have been literally pushing, uh, pushing for peanuts, as uh, as Coleman would say, right? right? And so I think you hit the nail on the head for sure. Absolutely. I want to get to the student question. So what are some, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, what advice would you have given your younger self in a university as a young woman? What what advice, knowing the, the work that you do now, um, what advice would you give? I, I like that question. Thank you, Zian. Great question. Zian, is, I would have to say that is one of our amazing Marymount uh, communication major students, um, outstanding students. So thank you, Zian. Great question. So we'll start. I'll start with Dr. Anderson on this one. I think the one thing I would tell um, I'm a, my younger self, see, huh, huh. Um, the no is your springboard. Because um, we're told we can't and we shouldn't and we mustn't a lot. And to um, and I think there are some places where my younger self agreed. But I think I would like to remind my younger self that the no is your springboard, not your stopping point. This is your place for you to Simone Biles that <laughs> out into listen, just do all those neat flip tricks that ain't nobody done before. And use that no as your moment to be able to do that, to show them what you really got as opposed to um as opposed to catering to what they expect. Your ex their expectation of you is not your standard. And remember to walk in your standard and not their expectation. Good. Dr. Corgan. Oh, what I told her, um, I, I wish I knew that the academy was so small. I wish somebody who would have hit me to that. Uh, if I had known that it was so small, I don't know that I would have kept pushing because it feels like uh, just in just a time, the tiniest space to exist in for precisely the reasons that Dr. Anderson just elucidated. Uh, but I think I, in encouragement, I would say it was worth fighting those battles. So it's OK to fight them. They'll pay off. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to pivot a little bit on that question, because you bring up an interesting point about the academy. What can scholars or young ladies who want to participate in communication do outside of academia? What, what advice can you give them? What direction can they go? If they, they know what they love, they're interested in communication, they found their niche, they don't necessarily want to talk to academics or do the academic form of writing. How can they live out their truth, be impactful, brand themselves, and market themselves to do what it is they love to do. Dr. Corgan, I'm going to start with you again, and then I'll come yeah, down I'm that way. I'm back at that really hard because really the trick is, is that your job is not you. You are not your job. Your job may nurture parts of you, but it does not care about you. And in order to be healthy and to be, you know, somebody who can build a productive, healthy community, you have to have some relationality to the world outside of your labor. So I would just say that that's probably the hardest thing for women generally in late capitalism is to figure out what the balance is between labor and the not labor. But I think central to that battle is really figuring out who to play with and who to work with and who you can do both with. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, Dr. Watkins Dickerson. So I would say don't settle, never settle. Um, your options are limitless, right? And I think for the longest time, I thought, oh, you know, as far as the academy, it, it, it only looks like this. It only looks like that. It looks like what you want to make it look like, right? And I wish I had the card that um, I picked up yesterday from an event, um, actually a military event that I did. I can't find it. But it basically said, when life hands you lemons, make orange juice and make them wonder why you did it, why and how you did it, something like that. And I thought it was so good because you know, being in all of these spaces, being in three spaces, a lot of people are like, 
that doesn't make sense. Well, why don't you just get a tenure track job? Or why don't you just do the military? Or why don't you just do consulting? Or why don't you do that? Why don't, why don't you calm down and live your life, right? And so I think that for me, um, when I was in college, back to the first question, but also to this one, right? Um, in college, I would do whatever. And I walked in, I mean, the, the, the sky wasn't, you know, tall enough for my head, right? But I was raised in an environment, and I think this is so beautiful, that I was taught you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. Do not allow university, do not allow society to let you lose that. But as I'm going to tell you, if you lose that later on in life, it's hard to get it back. And I'm on the journey to finding that girl again. I'm just being honest. And part of this military assignment has been that. Um, but don't settle. Never settle. Your options are absolutely limitless. And they look like how you want them to look like. That's a great point perspective that you offer that you don't have to do reductionist thoughts. So like, I don't have to be just this. I can be this and this or whatever I choose to be. So thank you for that reminder. Dr. Anderson, same same general question. Um, I'm going to take it back to the, the, the focus on technology. And Please. I'm going to say, um, don't wait for perfection to push record. Um, and that's really simple. And that can mean whatever you want that mean in terms of appearance, in terms of what you want to say, in terms of how you want to say it. It is OK for your thoughts and your expertise to manifest organically with people watching because people watching will give you more fodder to go in deeper into whatever your passion is. So don't wait for the perfect moment. Don't wait for the perfect article. Don't wait for the perfect research. Don't wait for the perfect hair day <laughs> to push record. Just do it because those conversations, like where I am as a scholar right now is very different than when I started my business in 2018. What I talk about, what I'm willing to be bold about in public spaces looks very different because in 2018, I was scared to push record. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I wanted everything to be just so. I wanted to, these words to be right. Now, I don't care. And I will tell people in a heartbeat that you're going to get this Spanish, you're going to get this French, you're going to get this academician, and you're going to get this hip hop in every single post that I'm going to put up here. But I'm going to have conversations. I'm going to engage. I'm going to say whatever is on my mind because that's how I'm able to think through my research. That's how I'm able to call myself expert in what it is that I'm talking about because I'm giving myself the space to brainstorm. And some of us are more audible learners than others might be. And those conversations are important. Being able to interact with other people. Well, what do you think about this? I think it's jacked up that we 125th in the literacy scale. What you think? <laughs> Whatever people's responses are, help me in terms of how I'm able to just really hone in on what I want the I want the general what I want general society to know about what it is I'm talking about. I can't just say, oh, all y'all got to learn Spanish. I can't do that. But I can have other conversations around what's going on with these teachers because we don't have it. Why is it that as Americans, we don't? But I didn't I couldn't have that. I couldn't ask those questions until I had those conversations. And a lot of those conversations might have happened with naked babies running around in the background or me cooking dinner or me just finishing a workout or whatever it might be. It didn't matter. The perfection was not the goal. The conversation was. And I want you all to center the conversation around your passion as opposed to what you look like representing that passion. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate that because we were, I was talking to my uh, media communication class and we were talking about perfection and that whole idea that we have now because we live in such a social media driven society where you have to take the perfect selfie or we take 20 pictures to get that one because a slight variation of our head, it's perfect then. So I, I even like that perspective that you offer, even in our work, when we're doing our scholarship, waiting for perfection, right? And I think we, especially when we're doing academic writing and we're promoting ourselves, we are trying to be perfect and fit that that type or that image that we have in our mind that we have to look like. So thank you for that reminder. I want to encourage everyone, we're down to like the last half of this. I want everybody, um, if you have questions, please go on ahead and put them in the chat or just raise a hand. I'll try to acknowledge a raised hand 
if you have one, um, because I really want the things that you want answered to come out today. This is a titillating conversation and everybody's doing great, um, but I want you to, to ask your questions if you have them. Uh, Dr. Cordigan has dropped into the chat. Um, this is a link to her, um, to Critical Feminist Conversations, an episode about perfectionism. So it was right on time. I think it just hit right, right at the right time. And so that's right there in the chat. She's made that available to us. So while you all are gathering your thoughts and your questions, I'm going to go ahead and ask this one. So can you give us some of the challenges that you face? What, what are some of the challenges that you have faced in your branding, in your in your move to brand? Um, all of you have established that you are... Um, you don't play by everybody else's rules, right? So you don't play by uh, white hegemonic male academy rules. You kind of make your own rule book and don't mind off-roading and that's great. But there's a time and a place that you can do that. So what are some of the challenges that you have found to either um, presenting your scholarship, uh, using technology to get your brand off? Dr. Anderson, you created an entire um, company to move forward the agenda of bi bilingual brown babies. So you had to even start a business because there was not even one that met the call. But obviously you've been wrought with different challenges. Dr. Dr. Corrigan, I follow you. Your humor is amazing. Um, I laugh and I chuckle and I'm like, I know that ruffled a couple feathers. And I've seen some of those, uh, some of the pundits come at you, double guns blazing, right? Um, and you take a lick and keep on ticking. So let's talk about some of these challenges that present themselves. Um, I'll go ahead and start with Dr. Anderson. Well, one of the challenges that um, I continue to face is this idea of why only Black babies? Why are you being so narrowly focused? Why can't you include? What about, what about, what about, what about? I get what about ism at least twice a week, twice a day from somebody. And um, and that has that means that I've been hit with the you're a reverse racist, you're this, you're like all these these monikers that have absolutely no substance or meaning in my life personally, <laughs> but also just aren't necessarily just ways to be able to just show how um they're exclusion is um is is warranted or their exclusion is their their offense of their exclusion is warranted rather and um one of the and that's been like probably the biggest challenge being able to justify like having to feel as though I, I don't justify anymore but at first I have to justify why only black babies why am I not including why is it this lovely very this lovely white family who is willing to pay is coming to me and I'm telling them no. And that challenge though, um, that that difficulty, those conversations have made my activism that much stronger because that is now, because it's showing me, hey, even in spaces that are supposed to be dedicated to the marginalized, they still want in. So how do you make sure that they are clear you cannot have in in this space? And what do they need to what do I need? What do I need to say to make it clear that I am repelling those who already have access to everything? This is an access issue. This is um, an issue about um, the ways in which the, the education system is repressive. This is the ways in which our, our communication style is seen as inferior and less than just because and really being able to to take those challenges and concretize the the argument <laughs> to concretize the activism to make it that much more um that much more powerful that much more potent for folks to be able to see and whereas i would in the beginning oh well no i only deal with black families and it's now it's like no I need to deal with black famous because black famous ain't got this. So you can go over there to Duolingo and whatever else you're doing over there. And I'm going to deal with my folks over here and they're going to meet you or actually they'll probably surpass you, but they'll, they'll we'll, yeah, we'll come together in Spain. Okay. We'll do that. And that challenge, but that challenge also has been powerful for just on a personal respect for my children as well. This is them being able to see what does it look like to have self-efficacy around your racial identity makes their conversations even better. So it's not just the, the work that I'm doing just as a scholar, but how that scholarship has permeated into all aspects. Like if you are 
truly for me if you're truly doing public scholarship people see it everywhere they see it they as soon as they walk in your door they see your public scholarship hanging on the walls they see your public scholarship in the way you've decorated your house they see your public scholarship in the books on your bookshelf it's everywhere if you are if you are truly engaged in this work so i think the challenges have actually helped me with making sure that wherever I turn, wherever I look, wherever I go, you will see bubbly, you will see vivacious, and you will see Black activists when it comes to language. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Corrigan, and then I'll, uh, Dr. Watkins and Dickerson, because I've got a, another question in chat, but I do want the challenges. I want everybody to hit the challenges. Go ahead, Dr. Corrigan. I'm the white lady who writes about Black power, and there's just the one. And when I came up through rhetoric, there was nobody really writing about Black power at all. And there were certainly no mentors at my institution to talk about it, even though obviously I've been deeply committed in a political way outside of my job for my whole life. So I want to I want to kind of piggyback off of what Dr. Anderson said, that there are always going to be people who are like, do a different project. Not this project. Right. There are always going to be people who try and T-bone you to do their project their way with their words. That is a perpetual thing. And you can you can't let them knock you off the horse. Right. Like your path is your path. And if you know that it's your path and you're surrounded by other people who are like this path is useful. Right. It's useful for me to be the white chick who does, you know, civil rights and black power because I'm in a lot of rooms with all white people. So I can take radical positions that other people can't take, right? And when I'm in, in rooms that are promiscuous that have people of color, I can stake out positions that they are too precarious to say because I can take the hit. Nobody's going to fire me. Not yet, anyway. So, you know, there's value to, ha to having people who can absorb risk. And that's one thing that I think ties the three of us panelists here together is that we have a very, I think, deft understanding about what our risk thresholds are and how much we can absorb. I'm white. I'm at an art research one institution. I've won the awards and blah, 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 blah. If you come for me, you are going to have to come all day long for the rest of your life. Because if I don't have a job, I don't have anything to do but come back at you. Right. So you have to decide. I'm not a pleaser, so that helps. But I've got an episode of the podcast about pleasing. But, you know, but you have to decide who are you? Where are you going? What are your values? And then you have to dig into that. And there, and it's those people are just trying to challenge you, just like Dr. Anderson said, so you can refine your goals. Right. And then build out your strategies and tactics. So, you know, I just think that there are always going to be people who want you to do something else and you got to stay the course if it feels like that's that's where you need to be. Because I don't want to run out of time, Dr. Rockets. I'm just going to let you answer this question first. And I don't want the preacher's version. I want a limited version of the answer. So here it is. This is the question. The question is, how have you sustained your confidence and stood strong to your passion within these conversations while facing the unfortunate uh, narrative of uh, Black women being difficult, bossy, or emotional. So, okay, I know you, Dr. Watkinson. Okay. Watkins Dickerson, the abbreviated version, please. So, lucky for you, I wrote this down. And lucky for you, I'm going to take a page out of Dr. Corrigan's playbook. So, as I said, I'm in the military. And to her point, once I made major everything changed, right? And so that gave me a sense of empowerment, not just personally, but it allowed me to give other people power that typically didn't. Other people access that aren't going to have access in the same spaces, right? I go straight into the general's office or the Fulberg Colonel or whoever. And not only that, as a chaplain, right? I always had access, but in particular, now that I have, I have a major, right? that there's a certain level of authority that that carries. And thank God I haven't been fired yet either. And so with that, to the first question or the previous question and to this one, um, the military does present its challenges because there are limitations to what I can say. There are limitations. And I give that disclaimer before I go. I say, hey, if my panelist says this, fine. But, you know, I can't because I like the way my checking and savings is set up and I like the way that my health care is set up. I'm just saying. But you have to have a strategy just because that's not necessarily the place where I can come to my full voice also doesn't mean that I'm stifled in other ways. Right. And so having that strategy strategy. So the military is a challenge, but 
to the question, believe black women. And I'm in a place in the military where I can speak for other black women that look like me, but they might not have the same rank as I do, right? And third, I'm gonna take this out of Dr. Corrigan's playbook and throw you guys a link. Um, and this happened just the other day, Dr. Harris, right? Um, please don't call me by my first name. Mm -hmm. Please do not. Um, you can call me doctor, reverend, chaplain, or major. Um, you know, if you don't have my number in your phone, please don't call me by my first name. And so setting those appropriate boundaries that align with your values, I think is the best way I would answer that. Thank you. And thank you for the link. It's there in the chat. And so Dr. Anderson, you kind of hit on it, but I want to go to Dr. Corgan. So you might not be a black woman, but I'm sure you've encountered conversations where people have said disparaging things to you based in gender and the area where you research. So how do you combat that? So I'm going to spin on that question that Amira asked for you. It depends on what people use. I'm interested in comedy. Right. Because it produces intimacy. I'm deeply mm -hmm. invested in things that shift the power dynamic so that we can come to a different place. So I also like I teach a lot of classes on how to negotiate. Right. Whether it's about money or politics, because the idea is that we need to get together and do the thing. So it depends. Friendly people do friendly fire. Right. <laughs> Dr. Watkins Dickerson, you know this. Right. So friendly fire is different than malice and mm -hmm. being able to produce discernment is probably one of the most important tools that you can have in your communication toolbox. And so you need to know which is friendly fire, right? Somebody had a bad day, they popped off, but they're mostly trying to do the right thing. And people who are coming at you with malice, the response is different for those two things. But if you don't know the difference between who's trying to build with you and who's trying to work with you and people who are trying to destroy you, you are going to make some tactical errors in who you're building with and spending time with. So I think Discernment is a really important thing that we teach in the communication field. It's a thing we all practice to vary in lesser degrees, and it helps us to decide. So what do I do to manage those people? It depends. Sometimes you can be disarming. I don't do a lot of charm, but I do do brutal honesty sometimes. And you can say, I feel like you're having a day. Should we like return to this some other time? They might keep coming, but they also might stop. It's, and if you're getting bullied, it's a different thing. And then that's brute force. So like, for example, you know, I went up for tenure and I put a bunch of more important people's letters of recommendation into my tenure file who were more important than anybody at my university. Why did they read them? I highly doubt it. But if anybody had a question about my tenure file, here are all these external stakeholders who are like, this project is important. So know how to create external accountability, especially for if, if you're having problems inside of your workplace or in a smaller organization. External accountability is where you get leverage. Okay, Dr. Anderson, same question, the bossy question. Um, I, I have freedom because I no longer have a university affiliation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that has bolstered a level of confidence in just who I am and what I bring. Um, one of the things is like, I'm no longer asking for a seat at the table because I am the table. Mm, I love and, that. I love and that. And understanding that, you know, there are some spaces, you know, like Dr. Corgan was talking about how the, the academia is small, right? And the table is small in academia. And when you make that decision, when I made the decision, I'm not going to say you because I'm not, I'm not offering advice on this. <laughs> but, um, when I made the decision to step away from that table and become my own, it changed my voice drastically. It changed how I said things, how I walked in spaces, how I walked in rooms, because I was clear the representation is me. Not that university, not that department, not the book that I might have been, I have a chapter in. It was me. And because of that, you need to see this boldness. You need to see this confidence. You need to see all of this as soon as I walk into the room. And it, it, it's a healing moment for those of us that might not feel comfortable with that. So these, I'm, I'm not saying that just because you took this one bold step means that you're going to be bold everywhere. It takes healing work. There were others, there were other bold steps that happened with that step that kind of added to it. But understanding that once you are clear as to how important you are, it makes it that much easier to walk in that confidence. And if you don't know how important you are, you'll never get it. 
you'll never get it. So if you can't look at what you've done and say, this is bomb, it needs revisions, but it's dope. (laughs) <laughs> if you can't do that with the work that you're doing, then it's going to make it harder for you to be able to have that confidence. You've got to be able to do that. you got to be able to say, this is fantastic and I'm going to tweak it as opposed to, oh, it needs a lot of work. No, this is fantastic, but let me tweak it. And being able to take that step is going to help you in terms of being able to have that confidence. And that is something that I would encourage, especially students to do now. Like when you're doing, you're writing your papers and you know what you're trying to do and you know what you're trying to say, you know that you're the only one that's saying it, say, sit in that mm-hmm. while you revise and edit and do what you need to do to submit it so that it is it is also as amazing to the professor that you're handing it into. You know what? That was just like the perfect segue to the end. So, um, because I'm going to give you everybody a 30 second wrap up. I'm going to give each lady 30 seconds to kind of just share what's on your heart um, that you want to share your closing thought with this amazing audience today. But I, I just I'm going to write that and I'm, gonna, I'm I'll give you some credit for it. We got to go in business with those shirts, uh, Dr. Anderson. I am not asking for a seat at the table. I am the table like and whatever you do. So students, whatever it is that you choose to do, you find your niche. So, yeah, it might be 10 people doing it, but they're not you. So if that's where your heart is, then you do it and you make you be your own table. So I just I love that. I'm going to I'm going to hang on to that. I needed that to feed off of that for me. So that was for me today. I appreciate that. I want to thank every last one of you amazing scholars for sharing your perspectives and your point of views. Um, And um, okay, yes, yes, you are a boss. (laughs) Absolutely. So 30 seconds, um, real moments, not preacher moments. Dr. Watkins Dickerson, I'm going to let you go first. Then with Dr. Anderson and Dr. Corrigan, your wrap up, your last thoughts. She's coming for me, y'all. Uh, this is my girlfriend. I can do that with you. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 no, first and foremost, thank you once again. And to the other um, ladies that are on this panel, Dr. Niles Goins, of course, as well. But um, real moments. Uh, honestly, I guess I'll end this way. And it kind of wraps all of this up, right? Um, not just using technology, but know that you are your brand wherever you go wherever you leave, whatever space, that is your brand. And make sure that you are not forgettable, not forgettable, right? And also make sure people know you're not replaceable um, because you're the only you. It's truer than true. However, Dr. Seuss said it, right? Hate to quote Dr. Seuss, but I mean, it just kind of fits here. But more than that, I would just like to end with this. Um, Number one, do the work your soul must have. That's Katie Cannon, not me. Do the work your soul must have. Not somebody else's soul, but do the work that your soul must have, whatever that looks like. And um, don't get consumed in the lie, the liability, and the language of imposter syndrome. Let's say it again. Do not get consumed in the lie, the language, and the liability of imposter syndrome. Um, kind of to the chat, uh, people will throw, they will project their own mess onto you. Don't accept that. Every quiz that I take in the military, I am the lone black and female in all of the tests. I'm controlling, I'm bossy, I'm this, I'm that, whatever. My joke since 2017 is, is I'm trying to be a white man by the beginning of the year. That's my New Year's resolution. Every test I take, I'm the only one over there. And instead of that being something that's difficult for me, I lean into it and I say, just that's my personality and this is what I like and and that's all there is to it. But with that, don't lean into the lie, the liability and the language of imposter syndrome because it really will tear you apart. So be you, do your thing and make sure you do the work that your soul must have. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, your closing thought. A lot of what what I wanted to say came from Dr. Watkins Dickerson. So I will just say this, um, and it just, it adds to what she just said. And that is, you are the unique identifying factor in everything. You, who you are, what you look like, what you do, how you write, how you speak, how you dress, 
You are the unique identifying factor. You are what sets you apart from everybody else. Everybody has different fingerprints for a reason. And it is to make sure that we remember that we are the unique identifying factors anywhere that we go. And just keep that with you when you're within whatever space you walk into. Thank you. And then Dr. Corgan, you get the last word. Have a crew. You know, you can't do anything if you don't have a crew. It's not possible. You need hype folk. You need people who show up. And you need people who will do reciprocal generosity to you. And I'm grateful, Dr. Harris, for your generosity and the generosity of the university and the panelists here today, because we got something out of this that I think was really valuable. It's really hard to be in higher ed right now as an instructor. It's hard to do tech work as AI encroaches. The algorithm is racist and sexist. And so these are dangerous times and you can't do anything. You can't have a come up if you don't have a crew who's willing to do reciprocal generosity. Appreciate it. And again, thank you everyone who joined. I want to thank Dr. Lillian Lodge Copenhaver, who's here, my fellow center leaders. I appreciate you all taking the time out. We're two minutes over. I don't, your time is precious. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The recording of this will be available later, and all the centers will share it on our sites. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>